Hey Roanoke, thank you for joining me today on another episode of If You Know, You Know, a municipal podcast brought to you by the city of Roanoke. I'm your host, Carol Corbin, and I'm here to bring you all things Roanoke. Here on If You Know, You Know, we go behind the scenes and learn more about the good and interesting things happening around Roanoke. And we introduce you to some of the amazing people who are serving our community. November is the gateway to the season of giving. And as we head into the holiday season, we want to share with you a new initiative from the Roanoke Police Department called Steady Blues and what that means for you as you're out and about over the next few weeks. Joining us first up on the podcast today is one of our community response officers. Officer Underwood, could you introduce yourself to our listeners today? Yeah, so I'm Officer Jacob Underwood. I am a community resource officer, a part of the community engagement team for the city of Rona. How long have you uh, been with RPD? So I've been there for nine and a half years. Mm -hmm. Um, I've recently uh, spent the last five months as a part of the community engagement team. Before that, I was assigned to Southeast, where I was a patrolman for about seven years. And with uh, community engagement or the Community Response Bureau, you are the officer for the South Side, correct? I am. Um, and can you kind of give us a little bit of insight on what you do as a community uh, resource officer? Yeah, so a lot of people uh, are familiar with school resource officers. They're there at the schools, they help out with the students. Well, I'm the same, but for the community. So for instance, if there's any type of burglary sprees or any type of crime that is occurring where I can go out and be a resource by going door to door in the community and handing out some crime prevention tips, but then also getting those residents and businesses uh, some resources that maybe I have that they don't know about, that is my job. I'm basically the one that's kind of bridging the gap in 2023 of trying to build community trust. But also, uh, I, a part of my job is to also uh, create events that we can basically help build the community in ways such as the community forums that I know that you have been a part of, the business forums, and basically just bringing more information on what we can do uh, to be at an event, have everyone come out, and just be able to ask questions. And so a big part of your job is to really get into the neighborhoods, meet mm -hmm. people, and start building those relationships. Um, what has been sort of the most rewarding piece of that coming from patrol mm -hmm. into this type of role? So in patrol, you see one of two things. You see the really good or you see the really bad because in that 911 call, it's okay. one or the other. You never mm -hmm. see that middle that middle of the road and, and get to really spend that time because you have to get in there, you have to get out of there, do it as you know effectively as you can. Gotcha. But then at the same time, you don't really see the after effects. And now in this role, I get to actually see the after effects. I get to build that trust. I get to go and speak to uh, businesses that maybe I was only saying hi and bye to within a few seconds. Uh, but then I also get to see the side of the community that I didn't know about. And that is what actually residential and business uh, owners or uh, people that just live in that community actually see, actually think about, because typically someone calls 911 when they're in a crisis, but we don't get to actually go and be a part of these community uh, neighborhood watch uh, for, you know, uh, meetings or Absolutely. any of those things okay. where they actually get to collectively talk about issues. And this could be issues from a barking dog to actually having some homelessness, uh, you know, with some unsheltered folks being on properties. and. If they don't call 911, typically we don't see that, but now we get to. Now you get to. And that's a that's a really interesting piece of the puzzle because you don't think about with patrol, you get the call, you're in, you resolve the issue to the best you can at that moment, but then you leave and it's out of your hands. And now you get the follow up. You get to see mm. the results and, and make sure that things follow through. Exactly. That's a really interesting uh, position to be in. Yeah. Right now we have two resource officers. Yes. Um, that, that sounds like a lot of work for you to cover the whole south side and <laughs> then this, one for the whole north side. Yeah, so uh, Officer Jeremy Marsh, my partner, mm -hmm. uh, we both work together. Uh, we have a north side and a south side. Mm -hmm. I am the south side guy. And we say that just because we want territoriality. That way people know who to come to. Right. But the two of us actually work and, uh, and, and team up on things all the time. And so we try to tag team things a lot because it is a lot. 
But I think what a, a lot of people don't realize is it's a lot because uh, it hasn't been done for a few years. We haven't had this unit for a while because of the retention issues, the, the COVID stuff. Gotcha. And now that we've finally been able to bring this uh, this unit back, but then also have a chief with uh, with uh, Chief Booth coming into office uh, a couple of uh, days ago or weeks now, um, he's very big on community policing. And so now having someone that appreciates that model, appreciates the community policing side, I think there's actually going to be some tasks that are divvied out to where we don't see that caseload. But I think it's just because instead of affecting one house through that 911 call, now you have one community that you're affecting. A whole community, absolutely. I, I like that. We need to get you on a billboard or a <laughs> PSA. No. That was wonderful. Um, so one of the big things we wanted to talk to you about going into the holiday season is the police department has started a new initiative called Steady Blues. Oh, yeah. Can you talk to us about the Steady Blues yes, program? Yes, for sure. So uh, Steady Blue uh, is a crime prevention initiative uh, that some agencies do around the clock, 365. However, we're going to try to implement it this year to help with holiday crime along with introducing it as a model of crime prevention that maybe we're going to look to in the future and actually implement throughout the year. Uh, and so we're implementing it at such a crucial time where a lot of businesses and a lot of residential areas see a lot of crime that occurs when it comes to burglaries, shoplifting, and just theft in general. Thieves start coming out around this time. Mm -hmm. And it's a crime prevention tip where basically uh, the mindset of it is officers are getting out patrolling the areas like we always do but the only difference is now we're actually going to have a blue light bar that is not the blue and whites that you see when you typically get pulled over it's just a blue light bar that is active and on in hopes that people of the community actually start seeing those efforts that we typically do but it's more enhanced because if they see the blue lights they know police is there. Police are here. If we wanted to get into some shady business, not <laughs> not right now. We've, we've got police in the area. And so are your light bars set up to where they can just do that anytime? So any police car could do the steady blue? Or is it something that you had to... Um, you know, purchase or get separate. So we, we did actually have to install them install. And, and, okay. into, uh, into some of the cars. And I believe we're actually working on getting all of the patrol cars that you see on the streets daily okay. tasked with that. Uh, I have one of those cars. Uh, that way I can actually show those off in, in a lot of the crime prevention forums and a lot mm -hmm. of the things that we do. And it's literally just a button, a function that we typically have where we have access to other lights on the car. Mm -hmm. And literally it's called cruise. And we just sit that or we hit that with our uh, finger and it literally lights up blue and it stays on until we turn it off. And it has the ability to, to basically be on while we're out of our cars. We don't have to be in it. That's the whole point. And it can actually be ran while the car is off as well. So when we get out on foot, we're out on a call, we're doing whatever. It's still drawing that attention exactly. to the presence. Yes. Very cool. And so we're going to pilot the Steady Blues from now through the holiday season. And then at that point, you'll assess, is this a crime prevention tactic that we could continue? Yes. I really, that is the hope. That, that's the hope. Yeah. Well, I mean, the hope is, is it does you know, what it's meant to do um, and bring attention to you and to the rest of your officers um, and stop some of these petty you know, thefts. I think about package thieves this time of year. <laughs> very, very um, big. Are there any type of you know holiday crime prevention safety tips that you guys have when it comes to uh, being safe while you're out shopping or protecting against the package thieves? Yeah, so uh, the, the package thieves is a really big one. And I, I hit on this last night at one of my neighborhood uh, meetings, and that is if you're actually at work all the time and you know that there is a package that's being delivered that may have some value to it, or you're out of town because it's the holidays. We can't always be at home Absolutely. during the holidays. And if you're out traveling, contact your USPS, you know, whether that, or I guess it would be the Postal Service, UPS, FedEx, whoever you use mm -hmm. to deliver uh, your presents or your goods or whatever you're receiving in the mail, do an informed delivery. A lot of uh, those, uh, those entities have that option. But then also, if you're out of town or if you're gonna be away for, uh, from your house for more than, let's just say, a 12 to 24 hour period, have those offices keep your packages to where you have to go and sign for them. That way they're not just sitting on your porch in plain view for 
countless hours for these thieves to just take a look at, see them, and then go after them. Absolutely. Well, and I think about uh, in my neighborhood, uh, my neighbor's travel a lot uh, they're retired and so we always get the texts like hey could you check on our you know front porch we might be getting a package this week so yes. <laughs> that is that's actually a wonderful thing is because when you have friends family or you just know your neighbors mm -hmm. and you have some neighbors that are out walking their dogs a lot or that you just communicate with it's so nice to just be able to text them and say hey i'm out of town or i'm going to be away do you mind checking because if they don't know about it then you're not going to know until you get back. Until you get back, and then that package is long gone. <laughs> and the second part about this is, yes, it's nice to have those informed deliveries. It's nice to have uh, people holding on to those packages or maybe looking out. But the second part is calling 911. A lot of people in 2023, whether it's trust or whether it's just the, you know, the, the, the times that it takes for officers to get there, whatever that mindset is, calling 911 and reporting it to us also helps you in that case because there's something there. There's an officer that's gonna be coming out to look for it. And the best part about this is when we come out to that house, you might not be the only victim. You might have also saved or helped so many others that had the same issue going Absolutely. on. Absolutely, absolutely. And so if someone were to call 911, um, I know that the ring cameras are really popular, yeah. as doorbells now, um, are those type of things things that help you as officers or are they something that you can't use? Them? They do. Okay. And, and, and I, I always say that that's one of the most important key pieces is that uh, if you have cameras, make sure you know how to use them. Okay. Make sure that you know how to access them because that's going to be one of the first questions that an officer asks is if you weren't home, did someone see it or did something see it? And that something is typically cameras or maybe even just that doorbell. That doorbell can capture so much stuff that we don't realize, <laughs> but it also doesn't help that if we don't know how to access it. And if you don't, that's what we are, are, are here for, for the, uh, the crime prevention you know, part of the community engagement team. Me and my, uh, my partner can actually work on helping you with those things. Oh, and that's so really great. calling into the police department and asking for us, we can actually do that as well. And I think it's the best part of sitting on your phone or sitting on your laptop, whatever you have it hooked up to, and just seeing what you can do with it. And then that way you at least have the knowledge that if something ever does happen, I can at least get that to the authorities. Absolutely. Yeah, because I think about um, people that I know that have reported or have had things stolen and they're like, I had a, a camera, you know, it was on my porch, but it didn't catch anything. Yes. <laughs> and, yeah. and so that's, I guess, when, you, when you're setting those type of things up to really be mindful of, you know, where you would want it to be pointed, where the access points would be, um, so that it does get the information that you guys would need. Yes. And, and, and that's a, a key feature there is, uh, I'm glad you brought that up, is if you're going out and buying cameras, if you're, if you're seeing a lot more of this crime prevention stuff that we've been talking about on social media and here we are talking mm -hmm. about today, if you go out and buy cameras, reach out to us in the community uh, engagement team because we actually will come out and help you set them up and, and let you know how to use your own tools. That way you can have success, but it also allows us to know that, that you're going to have success as well. It's that target hardening. It's basically just making sure that all the things that, that you are trying to implement at your home is working effectively. That way it's less uh, likely for a criminal to come onto your property and do those things. That is really cool. Like I, I just can picture you and Jeremy and like, I don't know, like <laughs> reflective vests and hard hats, like putting up, <laughs> putting up cameras and angling them the right way and making yes. sure. No, but that's a really great service to be able to provide to people because I know that we all want to arm ourselves with, you know, the most knowledge and the um, most protection that we can. If we do, you know, go the extra mile to get those cameras to make sure that they're used effectively, we know how to access the information and that you guys can help with that is pretty cool. It's a it's a big fear that a lot of ha uh, a lot of people have because not all cameras are very cheap. And and you kind of get what you pay for. And so I always say that if the mindset is that you're afraid of buying $1000 worth of cameras and you're afraid to have a delivery to where the the person that you're buying it from has to come out and install, well here's the thing. The police department does it for free. And that's what me and my partner uh, can help out with to help you if you're in need of that. And so I hope that that gets to a lot of people because it's it's something that I feel like a lot of people have fear of because I don't know what cameras to buy. I don't know where to put them. 
well, if you reach out, we can help. We can help. That's amazing. Well, in transitioning from um, safety for those deliveries at home, mm-hmm. are there any holiday safety tips when we're out shopping, um, you know, in our local malls or our local uh, businesses around the city? Yeah, there's a couple of uh, easy tips that I always like to, to look at. And that's number one, never be in a hurry. Because if you've ever been in a hurry, you know that you hit every red light. You're, you're always going to be even more pressed on time. And so I also mean that in the sense of shopping as well. I feel well. seen right now. <laughs> because, well, if you're in a hurry, your mind is just also in a hurry and you can't think. And so when you're going from store to store, your entire arm is filled up with several different bags. You're literally not giving yourself any ability to possibly move in, in, in the you know, case of uh, some type of criminal activity occurring. You know, that person may come up and steal your purse. That individual may come up and, and steal your bags. But if you actually have more arms and more leverage with less bags on your arms, uh, that's number one. And a way to prevent that is not being in a hurry or not going and doing all of your shopping in one hour. And then now I have to offload everything into my car. After every store, just go back to your car, drop it off, and then go back. It's tedious. I get it. Or just start using more shopping carts. That way, you at least can be able to ditch that in the case something does happen. Because safety is always the first element there. And if you can actually get to uh, safety the quickest, that's the best way. And when you're in a hurry, your mind isn't thinking about that. Uh, The second part of, uh, of that is when you are shopping and when you are doing these things, don't leave it in the front and back seat. Use the back of the car, whether that's the hatch, whether that's the trunk, if you have a sedan, because those areas can't be viewed from the outside. And so they'll never know. But when you have windows that they can look into to see what shiny objects you have and the expensive things, it gives them the more of the, the drive, the want to commit that crime. But then also now they're gonna start seeking the ability for that crime by seeing, oh, is this door handle unlocked? And that's what's going to give them that drive to do that. So limiting that and then also limiting you being in a hurry and then taking those safety tips to, oh, okay, how many bags can I uh, do I have here? Can I maybe put all of this into one bag instead of having 10 bags? So three easy tips. Three easy tips. Very, very easy. Um, I'm going to throw another one out, even though it's the one that I am most likely to break. And it's walking through the store with your earbuds in oh, and being zoned out. Yes. I'm the worst. Yes. But, you know, it. you can't be aware of other things if you're zoned out in your little music bubble. Well, hey, it, it, it's one of those <laughs> things that... The, 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 the market for those earbuds, those AirPods, the beats, mm-hmm. all of, you know, music's wonderful. It's an escape. It's a, it's a stress relief, but it's one of those things that I think we do more commonly now than we ever did. And it's also something that we use during our daily tasks, but something that you can still do by having the best of both worlds is instead of wearing both, wear one, because most of the time with those companies, I at least know from the Apple's uh, mindset of things. My one AirPod can still work while the other one's out. Absolutely. And that that way, at least you get you know some knowledge over here, and then you can still have some music over here. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Officer Underwood, it was great to have you in today. Thank you. We want to make sure everyone is aware that when you see our patrol cars or our police cars going through the city with their lights on, if they're not flashing, they're just letting you know they're in the area. Yes. You're not in any trouble. We really appreciate the holiday safety tips, and I hope that all of our listeners just flood uh, your inbox and your call, uh, your voicemail to get their cameras set up, to get you out to their neighborhood meetings. Um, We want to keep you busy. Well, hey, I I, I look forward (laughs) to that, but I also look forward for feedback. Even if there's not a question or helping or doing this or that, just give us feedback on how it was viewed from their end. Uh, because the the community is the best part about this because we don't know how effective we are through just the stats and the the data-driven stuff. We want to also see how effective we are in the community. So feedback always helps as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. Before we get into those big December holidays, let's not overlook this time of year where we begin gearing up for food, gratitude, and family. And speaking of family, November is nationally recognized as National Adoption Month. Joining us on today's episode is Family Service Supervisor Carrie Guzman, who oversees the Adoptions and Resource Family Program with the City of Roanoke's Department of Social Services. Carrie, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. So here on If You Know, You Know, 
we like to have our guests introduce themselves. So we not only want our listeners to learn more about what's happening in Roanoke, but also shine a light on awesome folks like you who work at the city. So Carrie, can you introduce yourself to our listeners? Yes, I'm Carrie Guzman. I'm the Family Services Supervisor at Roanoke City Department of Social Services over the Adoption and Resource Family Programs. And how long have you been with the city? I've been with the city for about seven and a half years. Oh, wow. Okay, all with DSS. Yes. That's yes. great. Foster care and adoptions and training. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, DSS has so many intricate teams, so you can kind of be at social services, but wear a lot of hats and learn a lot of different things. Yes, absolutely. That's true. And has adoptions been your favorite so far? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> of course. By far. By far. Oh. No, no offense to anything else that I've done. <laughs> but far and away, she's put a line in the sand. Um, Carrie, as I've said earlier uh, in our introduction, November is recognized as National Adoption Month. And on our website, the new director for social services, Gwen Coleman, has actually written a word of thanks uh, to anyone who's interested in either foster care or adoption in the city for coming to look at uh, that information on our website. And in that word of thanks, it mentions that we have over 200 children in foster care yes. in the city, um, which at first sounded like a lot to me. However, uh, I then started to go down the rabbit hole with my good friend Google, mm -hmm. along with some very trusted .gov and .org websites, um, not just any website. And um, the information out there is saying that nationally there's almost 400,000 children in foster care and over 100,000 children waiting to be adopted, um, which really put that 200 into perspective for me. Um, so. What I kind of want to go into with you is to try to get a feel for the process of what it takes in the city to really get into adoption. Well, so first, I do want to say that you are correct regarding the numbers. I mean, hey, obviously, <laughs> um, obviously, when you hear the numbers, when you when you work it, when you're with those kids, it it is a lot. Um, nationally speaking on a you know on a larger scale it isn't a, a crazy amount of children however um there's also parts that are maybe not fully understood so some children that are in foster care are actually adults they're between the ages of 18 and 21 and receiving fostering future services to help them gain stability and learn you know to be an adult um you know they're practicing their adulting skills with the support of the department behind them okay um you know and then we we also have children that are on their way to that, and they, they've chosen that. They want to um, turn 18 so that they in foster care so that they can access those services because they maybe don't have the support system that they would um, have if they were outside of the foster care system. And um, then, of course, we have uh, the, our big kinship push where a lot of children are being placed with kin or fictive kin rather than being removed or placed in foster care. But ultimately, if they end up needing supports, maybe it's help with childcare or services or something of that nature, then they come into foster care to get that support, but they're actually placed with family. So it's a little misleading when when you look at the big number um, and you're like, wow, that's, you know, that's really crazy. Yeah. But we're also providing a lot of services for kids that we wouldn't have otherwise and they they deserve it and their families deserve it so there's also a positive aspect in, in some ways to that no absolutely and so that's interesting to think that those children who are in the process of aging out um, in the fostering futures program that they're also included in the numbers um, that there are so many um, intricate placements that you could have mm -hmm. that all come together to be the big number but it's misleading about yeah. the level of services and care that they're getting. Right, absolutely. Um, oh, but sorry, to answer your question about yeah. adoptions, to get yeah. back on point, I just yeah, want yeah, to yeah. talk about the numbers for a second. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, no, to, for a person to get started in adoptions, let's say that there's um, average Joe citizen is like, I really want to be involved in this. We, we aren't an adoption agency at the Department of Social Services. When a child comes in to care, our primary goal is for them to return to their family. Um, that being said, it takes a large network of people to provide the services that the children need. Um, not just the children, the families as well. But, um, you know, if they were interested in being part of that process, 
but then just open to adoption at the end of it, that's something that we're really looking for. So um, to to do that, they would contact us and we would do an orientation and, and see if they are in alignment with our values and, um, and if we're the right program for them. So, you know, maybe what they're interested in isn't something that we would necessarily be the right fit for. For instance, if they really wanted a teen with maybe a higher level of needs or behaviors, then they might need the support that can be provided through a different kind of agency than ours. Um, but if we are a good fit and they are in alignment with our values and our mission, then we um, set them up to go through our pride training, which is our training for our foster parents. And we do home visits, we do a full assessment on them. Um, it's called a mutual family assessment. We go through all those steps. We talk with them about trauma and about behaviors and supports for children and family, family engagement, working as part of a professional team. And at the end, if, they, if they've if they gone through all the training, they've done well, and we feel that they would be an appropriate family, then we approve them. And then once children are placed in their home, should they become free for adoption in the future, then they are asked first before we would look anywhere else. That's that's still quite a process. So from the initial interest, um, it looks like we're kind of marrying foster care and adoptions together. Like they, it kind of goes hand in hand from the interest perspective from the get go. It, it really does depend on the family, but um, I think we can all um, appreciate that families that struggle maybe with something like infertility would be really interested in pursuing foster care and adoption versus maybe a family that already has six children. Um, but everybody has a different calling to it. Uh, maybe it's because they want a child in their home and they don't have one. It could be because growing up their parents were foster parents or um, it could be that they're, you know, for an example, a teacher in the school system, and they see these children having to move um, across the state uh, when they come into care because there's no local homes for them. So they have all kinds of different motivations. We try to be very clear from the beginning that we're, we're not going to promise you an adoption because our, our ultimate goal is that the family gets, gets things together and the child goes home. But what we want is for the child to have as few disruptions in their life as possible. So if the family that they were placed with would pursue adoption, if they're unable to return home, that is absolutely our goal. Okay, so I think that there can be a lot of like umbrella statements or generalizations about foster care and adoptions, but from what I'm hearing from you, everything is so specific to the needs of the children, the needs and wants of the individuals mm -hmm. that are interested in coming in. It's, it's a case by case basis every time. Every single time. Okay, well, even being a case by case basis every time, what is the length of time the process can take? So um, it's very difficult to speculate when it when you talk about from the start of a foster care case to the finalization of an adoption. That's almost impossible for me to, to guess at. I would say in a in a world where everything goes smoothly, um, you know, you're talking about a total of 15 months. Um, however, from from the time the child enters care until finalization, 15 months. But I can speak more specifically to when a child enters the adoption unit. So once the child is free for adoption, as if they are already placed in an adoptive placement, then it only takes about three months to finalize the adoption. Um, and that's just with um, without there being any kind of legal actions that would slow anything down, um, as well as the family being timely turning paperwork in. You know, we, we like to tell our families, it goes as fast as you do. Um, um, so, like you know, like so if, yeah. if you don't turn in your paperwork to me, I can't move to the next step. Um, but normally it's about three months um, with that process. Now, if a child does not have an adoptive placement, then we start the process of trying to identify a placement. We could do that through match events, which are held um, usually about quarterly in the state. Um, there's various match events. And then sometimes there's some virtual ones that, that children can go to. And we also send out referrals to therapeutic agencies. 
We talk about the children in need with our pride families when they're going through training to see if maybe there's a family that from the get-go we can be like, this this might be a good family for this child. Um, and so we try to look for opportunities to find the right fit because honestly, a poor fit is it's a poor fit for everyone and um, the worker included. So we want to make sure that we put in that effort to find the right family for children. And those match events, I, you mentioned they were held quarterly. Are any of those events held in or around Roanoke or do they sort of vary? Normally they're more in like the Richmond area. Okay. Um, it can depend. They can sometimes be in Northern Virginia. I'm unaware of any in the Roanoke area since COVID. Okay. But, um, but it may be that we just didn't have a child that needed to attend, so I could be incorrect on that. But um, we have had multiple, um, they're not match events, but they are like photo shoots and video shoots in the area where children can go. And um, for instance, we've done it where they've um, been brushing and petting horses while they talk about what they'd like to see in a family. Um, and it really helps to highlight their their best attributes and, and um, give watchers an idea of what this child's like. Are there, are there things that are sort of um, the umbrella of what the children are looking for? So what children are generally looking for, and they will not tell you this, is someone who cares enough to, to have boundaries and accountability. Um, if you don't have that, they'll, they'll surely take advantage. And, um, but they don't feel as safe. They don't feel as safe when there's not people putting in you know, those barriers to trouble. Um, but I think if you ask most of our kids that are looking for families or even children that are in families, like, what do you love about being there? It's having a support, someone that, you know, cares about you. Uh, they really enjoy showing them their good grades or their drawings oh, that they, yes. you know, um, made at school. And I think it's just having someone consistent to care and a safe place to lay their head at night. Um, you know, I think you do see a lot uh, when you look online, um, and they try to show uh, kids being grateful. Uh, usually around this time of year, it'll be like, what do you like about your family? And it's it's almost always heart tugging, you know, like um, we have dinner. Um, but, oh, you know, <laughs> sometimes it really is, it isn't even necessarily like they have dinner and it's because they didn't have food before. It's that they have dinner as a family. Um, you know, that's maybe something very different from what they're used to. So I think that it's a wide range, but they just want someone to care about them and they want to be safe. And it, it kind of seems like it's the things that they're saying without saying it. Yes, yes, I, I absolutely. Get that. Um, again, as I'm going through and, and trying to think about uh, non-specific questions that I have here, what qualities make an ideal adopter, an ideal adoption match? What What are your team looking for uh, when trying to match those families? Um, I'm glad you asked. I actually, we have so many things. I could go through and just list off like really quick characteristics, but that's not really my style. <laughs> um, so obviously one thing um, we're really interested in is people who are family or fictive family. So, you know, if um, a child already know someone, then it they don't have a, as much of a disruption and even their their thought processes, their comfortableness, uh, you know, with other people. Absolutely. And so, um, and it's proven that, you know, being with Ken can um, promote family and cultural connections. And so um, there is that benefit of um, finding someone who's kin or fictive kin. Can I pause yeah. you real quick? What is what is fictive kin? Okay, fictive kin. So kin is relatives, and okay. then fictive kin is like, mm, you know, you're almost like my aunt, you know? So this is my aunt who's not really my dad's sister, yes. but she's been my aunt my whole life. Yes. Okay, um, got it. Yeah, so... Uh, that's funny. My husband actually uh, grew up in a family calling someone his aunt and then realized when he was 20 that she was not actually related to him. Um, so it's kind of that idea gotcha. of your extended family. And it and it doesn't we have a, it doesn't have to fit a certain parameter. It could be your teacher at school. This is a person okay. that cared about you before you ever touched foster care. You had care. a connection before yes. that happened. Okay. This is a, a connection from your world before foster care. 
Okay. And so um, those people are more likely to be able to keep those family and cultural connections than maybe someone who was not part of your world before. To ease the transition. Correct. Got yeah. It. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. No, no problem. <laughs> um, and then uh, something else is uh, that we have found not just in the beginning when identifying a family, but long-term is finding a a family that believes in the importance of services and and ongoing services. So we're not talking about speech where you do speech and all of a sudden you can say your L's and you don't have to do it anymore. Um, But this is more like, oh, the child was receiving um, counseling, but now foster care is over, we can move on. And we stop counseling because the kid's doing well. Well, they're doing well while they're receiving that service. And so we've found that long-term, children do better um, in the homes when the family's really committed to those services continuing. And even if they take a break, which is fine, um, but are you willing to return to it? You know, are you willing to step into whatever, you know, that means for your life? Because sometimes that means missing work. Um, and so being able to do that, that's that's also a big um, a big thing for us in adoptions. They have to be realistic and flexible with their expectations of the children. Um, a lot of our children, no, let me change that. All of our children have experienced trauma. And um, being removed from your birth family, regardless of anything that happened before, is traumatic. And so they they don't necessarily always respond to things in the way that people would say a typical child would react. Okay. And so they need to have realistic expectations about how they're going to handle things or what their behaviors might be. But they also have to have real, realistic expectations. Most of us adults were not amazing as teenagers. <laughs> um, we think we were fine and our parents were too much. But yeah, I could see coming into this and not that you're unrealistic, but having sort of maybe unrealistic hopes that something might go a certain way yeah and i think that we have a tendency to i don't know how to explain it exactly but you know when you have a backstory how you may look for something like for instance if you're told that a friend steals you may start looking around being like hey is anything missing um i know she she steals um so i i feel like there's kind of like this this thought with these kids they have this traumatic history and we do a lot of training on that and we're like hey they may have a lot of these issues we need to be really um understanding of their needs and then they see little behaviors are very normal like like teens sometimes don't tell you the truth. Um, that's not they're they're also not very grateful for most things. And and you know, and so I mean, it's really it's, not about their trauma. They're just an average teen. That's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. This whole conversation is making me want to call my mother and apologize. <laughs> It's like I felt, I'm like, yeah, I probably like, you know, didn't clean my room enough and, you know, talked back and sassed her when I shouldn't have. And I'm sure that these are things that your adoptive and foster families go through all the time that it's like, no, this isn't a product of trauma. This is a product of being a teenager. Yeah, it or is. Or a child. Absolutely. Yeah. And and I mean, obviously there are some things that make it a little bit worse. Maybe, maybe your kid has attitude and they don't have um, a great ability to cope with with changes okay so maybe the coping with changes is related to the trauma but you know the underlying issue that's one that oh you know all these kids are sharing yeah yeah that's just being a kid yeah that's and that's probably something that having realistic expectations helps to to bring that down to an average level for everyone so you're not always as you said looking for things sometimes mm-hmm. you're just looking for a kid to be a kid yes yes and and actually it kind of runs into the last one i was going to say which was just that and this is going to be tough for some people to swallow but i do think the best parents are the ones that recognize fault in themselves so um sometimes it's not about our kids sometimes it's about our relationship with our kids and are we willing to put in the effort to improve that um so i do think that a lot of times when the kids get a little bit older and you know it it could be anything that they're upset about but if our communication with them isn't good you know what are we going to do about that um it's not just about them fixing things they're not just something broken that needs fixed you know we are a part of having the good communication so i think the best families end up being willing to participate in services with them and figuring out what they need 
uh, between everybody involved to make sure that you know the placement is a success that the adoption is a success and also that the child feels supported and doesn't feel like people are pointing fingers at them a lot of kids in or out of foster care have issues and so we just want to make sure that our families that we're approving the ones that we're working with um, that they have an understanding that kids are kids and it's very normal to have problems but if you're not willing to step in to be part of the solution you know that's that's a big issue for that child um it's hard it's hard being a kid in, in general but having to figure it all out on your own is almost impossible how many uh foster families or adoptive families do you typically work with like what is the stock of oh families? our stock of families yeah. <laughs> okay so as of today we have 111 approved foster families um okay. now that doesn't mean that all of them are looking to do long-term fostering we have um, plenty of families that are just interested in short-term respite, and I'll make a shameless plug that we need respite families. So I think a lot of times people think, I'm not, you know, maybe they're a little bit older. They're like, I'm not in a position to raise a child again, or, you know, or I don't have the energy to be chasing, you know, kids around my house for the re you know next two years. But um, respite provides an option one for our adopted kids to to get a break from their parents and for their parents to get a break from them <laughs> um respite also helps our foster parents uh, maintain their placements because sometimes they already had a trip planned when the child was placed with them they're not able to take them well what are we going to do um to make sure that that placement stays stable um or it could be that they have a work trip that they have to go on and children okay. aren't welcome um we always encourage our families to take kids on vacation Vacation and almost all of our families um, do that but occasionally there are those little exceptions like how do you take them on a bachelorette party weekend like you can't do that yeah but we shouldn't do that <laughs> yeah yes don't <laughs> um do yes <laughs> um but so we really need these respite homes to be able to fill in that gap but also when we get a call at 2 a.m and there's a kid and and maybe the mom needed emergency surgery or oh. um you know the it could be anything it could just be that grandma lives one state over and she needs time to drive um over here to pick the child up and if we had a respite home available, that child would never have to enter foster care. We could place them in a respite home um, until the grandmother got here or until the mom recovered from the surgery, and then that child could be with family. Well, since we're in uh, a shameless plug mode with respite homes, does that follow the same process? You have to... It is or... as intensive. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, just... it, it is as intensive, which isn't, um, I know, as inviting as I tried to just make it seem. Um, but we do give you dinner when you come to well, Pride. Well, sold. No. Um, and we have child care. So we'll give you child care for, you know, you don't have to find your own child care and we will give you dinner. And, and honestly, it the training itself helps prepare you for a lot of what you see. Um, so even if we could shorten it, I don't know that we would because I think it's really important, you know, for these kids that didn't expect to leave mom, especially, you know, if she had an emergency surgery, maybe she left on a, in, in the EMS, you know, that's pretty traumatic. So they need to know how to respond to that if they're with them. And again, every situation is so specific because that's something that I wouldn't have thought about. A single mom has to have emergency surgery. Grandma's a state away. That's not a situation where a child is that you're typically thinking in your head, this child's going into foster care, or this right. child's having to go into care, uh, but they potentially would if there wasn't a respite situation. Yeah, or if they that's, didn't have any support, you know, if they're new to the area and they don't have support or if they don't have a friend, but sometimes it could be that they're not even in a position to provide the respite option. So, you know, I mean, they're, you know, maybe in and out of consciousness or something, you know what I mean? But is there, do they have it together enough to give us consent to put them in respite? Are we able to get that? You may not be together enough to get your phone out, log in, call your mom, explain the situation, <laughs> you know, but but you are together enough to give to, to give us consent so that we can make sure your child doesn't have to enter foster care. That is, again, just a truly interesting scenario that I don't think a lot of people think about when you have the typical thoughts of foster care and adoption and and what that world looks like yeah absolutely and, and i mean even um 
I think November is also um, was National Homeless Month. I believe is also one of the things that, that November is. We have to share months. They do have to share. They're months. very tight. Um, <laughs> but um, only twelve. And uh, but if you found yourself homeless and you had children and you didn't have anywhere for them to go, you can actually temporarily put them in foster care, and we can place them with a foster home where it's it's timed, and you get you know sixty days to go and find you an apartment or stable housing and and that's temporary versus um having to deal with a situation where we find out you're homeless and your children don't have shelter um which becomes a different you know scenario well that's definitely a call for service to let people know that again foster care doesn't necessarily lead to long-term foster care does not lead to children being placed into adoption It, it could be utilized for something temporary in that situation absolutely i'm we're learning so much today and i appreciate that after the adoption process is finalized on your end do your team uh follow up with the families do you have additional care and supportive services that go through and if so how long does that last so when adoption finalizes we we give our final the worker who does the adoption gives their finalized like little letter that says hey this is your new worker this is your post adoption worker she's not she or he currently she <laughs> um is not going to come to your home every month but if you need them they are there and so we give them that contact information and then um and steps on how to get new documents but then um After that, we do send them a letter every year just to check in, make sure everything is still okay, the child's still with them, everything is all right. Um, And then we have some events like we celebrate, um, you know, National Adoption Month with our Adoptive Day, Adoption Day event, which is a private event. Um, But, you know, we invite our families to participate in that. And then... um, we are working on getting our um, private Facebook group where we can share trainings and other kind of get together opportunities with our adoptive families. And uh, we also do refer for post adoption services. And in our area, DePaul Community uh, Resources is the provider for our post adoption services. And they're lovely. They just had a dad's night out at the rail yard dogs game and family game night and parents night out. And so that that's another support that's um, in the community for them. And that's until the child turns 18. And so if they're in a sibling oh. group that was adopted and you have like a 16 year old and a three year old, it's until that three year old turns 18. Um, okay. So it's a great service. I'm going to uh, shine a great big light on the adoption team for DSS because Woo. you are consistently one of the top agencies in the state in finalizing adoptions each year. Um, I have data, my data runs fiscal year, which is not calendar year, which always gets confusing when we start counting data. Mm -hmm. Um, But we are looking at uh, in the past three years, past three fiscal years, everyone, don't come for me, uh, 137 adoptions in the past three fiscal years, um, which is fantastic. I mean, I feel like the the work of foster care and adoption placement must be really difficult sometimes. And so having such a shining light on you of the wins that you have must really help keep your spirits going. Yes. No, I'm just kidding. That's not going to be my only answer. (laughs) Um, Yeah. When I started in adoptions six years ago, six and a half years ago, um, things were at a much slower pace. Um, It's... It's the process that was always in place. Um, but actually someone who is my sen- uh, is now one of my senior workers, she had kind of tried to find ways to cut down on time that it takes to get adoptions done. And um, she went out on maternity leave and I picked up where she left off and we reduced adoptions from taking about nine months to a year to about nine weeks to 12 weeks. Um, So we were able to really speed things up, which is why um, I think it was six six years ago, we had this incredible year of having 75 adoptions in one year. Um, And that's where we had all these kind of like backlogged adoptions that needed completed and we just pumped them out. 
Um, and since then, we've can st- we've stayed on that path of trying to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to get them done as quickly as we can. That being said, um, my staff is phenomenal. Um, I I wish that we were in a situation where I could show you our joint Christmas picture, um, <laughs> listener. But we we did in fact uh, get our Christmas pictures taken together. We um, work very well together. We um, we do a job that is. Uh, trying we'll use the word trying at times there's lots of great things about adoptions but um but it can be a difficult job and we're able to lean on each other for assistance and uh, make fun of ourselves and each other and that creates like a really great work environment for us and by far my team is my favorite thing about my job um but they are they are strong um workers and uh, yeah, I mean, we also have great community partners that we work with to like finalize adoptions, like our attorneys that we use. And, uh, you know, we do take a lot of satisfaction out of um, our hard day's work. I want to take a quick moment to talk about that reduction in time frame. Is that just relooking at, you know, those old policies of this is the way we've always done it? Is that talking to people at the state is that how I mean because that's impressive that type of time reduction so um yeah so it was a a revisiting of how things were done and I'll be honest that a lot of our localities are part like our localities around us they don't have um as many children in care they're very small very you know rural communities and they don't do that many adoptions so it's not uncommon that their adoption would take a really long time to do because they're not as familiar with the process and so i think we weren't holding a mirror up to our processes to do better than that because we are efficient and we were continuing to do them i will say um i'm not going to name names um she, if she listened she would giggle but i had a, um a, a co-worker who was like you can't possibly do them this quickly and i was like you watch me and since and then did. we did and i ended up moving into a trainer position so i would train the new adoption workers and i trained them to do it just the way i did it and then became the supervisor and i expect them to do it the way that I did it, unless they have a and new method that's better than mine, a I'm new, willing. I'm a willing new better to. method, but you know, I think there's only so much we can They're, cut off that time. That's <laughs> that's true. But if they have something, I'm willing to hear. Yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely, Carrie. I really appreciate you being here with us today. I want to know: Are there any final thoughts from you on the importance of adoptions? And if someone is interested in fostering or becoming an adoptive parent, what's the first step? Where do they need to go? Um, so, um, if you're interested in being at, if you're interested in fostering and into adoption, possibly, uh, should a child become available, then you can reach out to Roanoke City DSS and ask for someone in the resource family program. Um, we have, um, two additional staff, um, uh, outside of myself who work with our general foster families. If you are someone and you are like, I know a child who's in foster care and I would like to be considered for their placement and so you wanna be a kin or effective kin provider, we also have someone who specializes in that. And um, so you could ask for me or you could just ask for our program and or any of those other lovely ladies, Ashley Goad, Kim Morris and Lauren Harris. Um, they are all Shout wonderful. Out. Yes, absolutely, <laughs> shamelessly. Shamelessly. Yeah, doing the good work. Well, again, thank you for being here and good luck with the rest of the year and many more adoptions. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And that's going to be a wrap for us this month on If You Know, You Know. Make sure that you follow along, like, review, subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.